Bob, well, here we are again, the two of us, sharing thoughts and ideas, learnings around uh, Kaizen. Thanks for being here again. It's a pleasure to see you again. Yes, it is there. Um, Bob, um, I had a few questions prepared for you related to, of course, the actualities of uh, 2020, the COVID, the pandemic, uh, pand pandemic I have to say. Um, and a few questions around that. I would like to hear your uh, ideas, opinion. First of all, um, uh, when I speak to leaders, some friends, but also people in business, they're really very busy. In, in having all these digital meetings. And they say, well, you know, first it was nice that we have this digital opportunity to see each other and have at least continuation in doing business. Uh, but then now after, let's say, what is it, about five, six months, more and more people start complaining about physical problems. It's of course, you know, being at home for a while and sitting in the kitchen or other places, but especially also people that have a, uh, responsibility in sharing a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, meetings, uh, digital meetings with people like 10 or 15 people together. We talk about headache, we talk about uh, sore neck in relation to the many digital meetings. Huh? Um, and uh, that they are tired faster than in the usual, at least, situation before and have concentration problems. So I thought, I mean, we talk about Kaizen, mastering things. I think, I thought, you, I think, I think definitely have some ideas, some learnings also from your side, what you hear uh, about what is it that's going on actually. Yeah? So to say, what do you think uh, are the main reasons for the phenomena in relation to our brains, yeah? in relation to, uh, to fear maybe, and the practical advices you have to overcome these problems. Yes. Could you share something uh, with us? All of those things that you're describing are certainly absolutely correct and the things that we see here in the States as well in terms of the amount of energy and concentration it takes to, to do these uh, programs online as opposed to being face to face. Yeah. So in terms of headaches and fatigue and lack of concentration, uh, some of the Kaizen solutions to this are to first of all recognize it and so um, there's something called ultradian ry rhythms, which for reasons nobody can understand, the brain has about a 90 minute cycle. The brain can- 90? Nine zero, 90. Nine zero, yeah. You can concentrate for 90, now this is in face-to-face -face meetings. You can concentrate for 90 minutes, you dream every 90 minutes. The brain seems to have a 90 minute cycle. Now we think um, that's true if you're in a meeting face-to-face, uh, -face. Um, but again, requires so much more concentration and there's so much less energy going back and forth because, again, it's all electronic. So the recommendation is every 50 to 60 minutes to take a five to 10 minute break um, mm. is, one, is one Kaizen solution. There's actually research on this, Martin. Uh, Harvard Business Review did a study with about a half dozen different professions. Uh, accountants were one of them. Uh, places where they could measure productivity. And what they asked the experimental group to do is every 90 minutes, take a three minute break, uh, go get a glass of water, go up a flight of stairs, check the sports scores, anything other than the project you're working on. And by whatever measures of productivity they could find, it went up 10, 20, 30%. So uh, honoring the body's ability to only sustain concentration for a certain amount of time is useful. So uh, the recommendation is 50 to 60 minutes maximum for any meeting before you take a break. There's a couple other Kaizen techniques that are very helpful. One is sitting versus, um, uh, sitting versus standing. Yeah. Um, if you can in your meetings, uh, it's much easier to do a course online than it's perhaps in a classroom or, or office building, is to stand up and stretch and move around a little bit while you're talking. The, our bodies are basically the bodies of a hunter-gatherer, and hunter-gatherers moved. Um, they actually, from, from the few hunter-gatherer tribes that are still around, they seem to average between 12 and 17,000 steps a day, whereas most of us have to, have three to 5,000. So our bodies genetically are designed to move, and there's nothing harder on your heart than sitting. 
In fact, some mm -hmm. of the research from the Mayo Clinic, very prestigious clinic in the United States, found that sitting most of the day without getting up, stretching, moving, has, is the same risk as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day in terms of your heart risks. Really? Um, yes, there's a book by one of the main investigators, I think his name is Levine, at the Mayo Clinic called Sitting Kills. So it's very hard on the body. Lowers blood pressure, lowers uh, HDL cholesterol. Uh, we're just not designed to sit. So uh, again, even even fidgeting can do that. Standing up instead of sitting. But again, that's another Kaizen technique that's useful. Um, so taking breaks, doing something physical during that three to five minute break you're taking. Uh, being physical and moving while you're actually having the meeting, which can increase blood flow and, and creativity and concentration, and having nothing more than a 50 to 60 minute meeting before you take a break. And you say the break, you just mentioned three to five, is, is like this. It's not like having a break of 20, 30 minutes. It's just no. a momentum of just... Just giving uh, the brain a break from what it's doing. So you can experiment in your... Oh yeah. Again, it may vary based on what the meeting's about and how, how long the meeting's going to be anyway. Uh, so you may want to, your groups need to experiment and see whether five minutes may be plenty for people because otherwise they start taking phone calls and then you have people coming back late from the breaks. So you really have to do it within whatever the culture is depending on the meeting. The other thing we need to appreciate is brains aren't, decide, aren't designed to concentrate. You can train your brain to focus, but it's not its normal state. Again, we're hunter gatherers genetically. Just to, we've been on the planet, we estimate a couple hundred thousand years, but only about 10,000 years ago did we stop being hunter gatherers and wait for crops to grow and animals to fatten. So most of our genetic code is still hunter gatherers. So if you and I are walking on the savanna and, and we're just admiring some beautiful tree, some hungry lion or panther is going to find us delicious. So while we were walking the savanna, we're looking around to make sure that those bushes that are moving are the, is the wind and not a lion. So for brains to keep looking around at everything uh, was its normal state. So to train your brain to focus just on what somebody's saying to you and nothing else you can do. Brains are very adaptable. But we need to realize it's, it takes practice before you can just focus completely on what that other, other person is saying and maintain that concentration. And now you're saying sitting, standing, but I realize, for example, when I, I have people on the phone and we discuss things, then I usually stand up uh -huh. to focus and then I start of yes. sometimes close my eyes and discuss and, you know, like to focus myself in my head. This is, of course, standing up. Has it also something to do with, with blood? Uh, uh -huh. I don't know, a circulation or so to energize myself because standing or walking when I had, I had a, uh, yesterday I had a nice uh, walk with someone. Uh -huh. And what I realized if you, when you walk, there is, it's much easier to connect. Yes. Much easier to discuss and be very open about sharing things. So that's, that's a legal way nowadays, you know, get your uh, uh, lunch on the road and, and have a walk. But that's also then it's even more than just standing. It's also the walking, is it? Yeah, the, the more you move, the better. But standing rather than sitting is better. Sitting, standing's better than sitting. Moving's better than standing. And even if the moving's just kind of jiggling around a little bit when you stand up or just stretching. So any movement at all is burning calories and giving your brain a chance to refocus. So yeah. those are the things we recommend the most in terms of how to deal with um, so much time we're spending. The other thing we're finding in the States, I'm sure it's the same there, since people aren't commuting, they're actually spending much more time in front of a computer screen working. So many people are working longer hours actually than they did oh. when they were in the car listening to music, driving to or from work. Yeah, you have to reorganize it. And uh, yeah, yeah. I was also thinking, is it because you have the meeting now. Now the two of us, we we, we look at each other like this. Yes. Um, but if you have seventeen people on the screen, they're all looking <laughs> in your face. And usually, you sit, you know, on the ta uh, next to the table, and you can see each other a little bit. But it's not like all these people uh, exactly. directly in your face. That's also different, isn't it? Very different. Yeah. 
very different. to interpret and to see all these movements and all the stuff and yeah right and you feel more compelled to focus you know if you're if you're standing in front of a room doing powerpoint um then it's all right for me to look look, look down take some notes um drift off a little bit but if, if it's this intense where you're just having a face-to-face -face conversation if i start looking away you start thinking, what's wrong with this guy? What's I want to see what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so it, the the one-on-one -on -one piece of it can require much more concentration than we're accustomed to. And that may even, and isn't necessarily healthy for us. Yeah. Now I had um, so, so things that in one step deeper, if we go again to the, the topic we love discussing saying, okay, a Kaizen, how do we keep the teams, the people, yes. you know, moving, huh? I, the other day, I also uh, bought, bought a book uh, about uh, inspiring uh, leadership on a, on a distance. I have to uh, uh, more deep dive in, into the, the book, but I was really thinking, how could we now in these days, not saying, oh, there's so much we cannot do, but given the circumstances, what is what are the new opportunities? If we talk like, okay, uh, what are the opportunities in the situation we're in now? Huh? So we are limited in, you know, physically, meet huh? uh, people remo work, work remotely many people going for office uh, but uh, what are new opportunities for example i was thinking there is much more opportunity to uh, talk one-on-one -on -one, huh? people are yeah uh, usually in, in a factory you have this this group there is opportunity to maybe uh, organize much more than one-on-ones but -on uh, what you say over time there's maybe much more time i, I don't know I'm thinking out loud now, uh, um, uh, short interventions instead of big you know, meetings. The last one is not possible. Huh? So what are your suggestions? We're talking about Kaizen to, to stay uh, being the leader, to keep people energized. What are ideas from your side? Yeah, it's, um, it's in interesting if you already have, there's a couple ways to answer one is if you already have a kaizen culture and one is if you're trying to build one if you're trying right. to build one you can sometimes use uh, the internet very skillfully because again um, you could do many lectures five ten minute lectures you can show video you can show powerpoint um, yeah. we, we can certainly make some of that available to to, 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 to your viewers um, so that they can start to educate people about the power of, of small steps. Because unless people feel comfortable and that this is part of the culture, they're going to feel embarrassed bringing up something that's very small and trivial and they think may only apply to them or to their small team. So you can build a Kaizen culture with that kind of education online in some yeah. ways easier than you can uh, in other uh, contexts. And I'm, I don't mean an hour lecture because many people aren't interested in that but just like five, 10 minutes at a time. The other thing that there's an enormous amount of, of growing research on is basically the topic of curiosity. And they've done surveys, one of the US surveys was with 3000 people and asked them if they felt that their curiosity was rewarded at work. And it was close to 90% of them felt no, that they, they weren't encouraged to bring up ideas and questions. So one of the techniques that's actually been researched and proven successful, particularly during the COVID time, is to have a question that shows up when you turn on your, your work computer in the morning, just to ask a question. What is the one topic or activity that you are concerned or interested in the most at this time? Just have the question come across the screen. Um, and what they found when they tracked this is people came up with many, many more ideas on how to improve whatever, whatever process or product they were engaged in. Because as we've, we've talked about before with your viewers, the, the, the strange thing about the brain is any question you ask repeatedly, the brain's compelled to take in and starts its own Google search. So just having, and they've, they've experimented with different questions <coughs> coming across the screen. Uh, that was the that was the most effective at getting people to be creative, inventive, and want to participate. So there's a part B to this, but again, the question is, um, and I wrote it down: What is one topic or activity that you're concerned about today? Now, again, the person doesn't have to come up with an answer because, as we've talked about, if people feel pressured, it turns on the amygdala, shuts down the cortex, and you've essentially defeated yeah. your purpose. So they just have to 
ask the question. Um, and so um, the, the other thing that's key, and Toyota talked about this at great length, is if somebody comes up with, a, with an answer, something they think is they're excited about, you have to be very careful to share their excitement, ask more questions so you can understand better what the issue is they're trying to address, even if the solution isn't very practical or too expensive or has any other, and then find ways to reward them for bringing it up. Because if I bring up some idea, you're, you're my manager, I bring up some idea to you and you're dismissive or distracted or critical, uh, I'm, the chances I'm ever going to do that again are pretty small. So you really want to train your, your line managers and your, any, any managers at all that they have to be very careful to encourage that kind of creativity. Yeah. And as we've talked about before, um, what Toyota does if they get an idea they think is really absolutely dangerous or inappropriate is they, they think here's an opportunity for us to retrain this person so that they're not making mistakes um, so even bad ideas become a very useful tool for managers to see where their employees have not essentially been trained well. Yeah, yeah. So, so talk about the curiosity. At the beginning, you mentioned digitalize the things you did before, which is, uh, of course, a good advice. Right. I, I heard the, um, I, I thought also an interesting comment uh, one, one guy told me this week, saying, you know, before I had meetings and I, what is the, the word? I interpret already the way people were sitting there, you know? So people were in a meeting and I interpret like, oh, he's this, doing that or whatever. But now in the meeting, I just don't know. So I have to ask. And because I have to ask, I sort of deep dive in, you know, I, I sort of, we start discussing, yeah? what do you yes. think about? So I'm more sort of alert, hey, sort of uh, better alert about saying, hey, is everyone really talking? Or, hey, this guy is quiet. And before he wasn't even realizing it. I thought it was also an interesting one. As yes, a positive takeaway from this, uh, this situation. Yeah. And one, one, one way to also take Kaizen and address some of what you're talking about is to say what I'd like to do at each, each meeting at the start is to hear about one small victory or one small moment during the week workday that you enjoyed so that you're essentially warming up the group, getting everyone to participate. Because um, the kind of casual encounters, like you know, be before you and I do each of these interviews, we catch up on our families, we talk about the weather and how each country's dealing with COVID and we talked about the election. So there's those kind of human encounters that people were doing on their walk to the me meeting room all that stuff is gone. So we almost have to ritualize it. Um, and you could do that with Kaizen in terms of uh, any small moment, uh, any time in this day or if it's the week, weekly meeting uh, once a week um, that you're, or you're gonna come in with either one victory, one thing you're enjoying or happy about just the, and then, and then you, you go around the room. And we, because we, we, we do this in our faculty meetings but we say, look, if you don't have anything or you don't feel like talking or you just came from home and you're rattled, whatever, um, you're welcome to say pass because we don't want people to feel pressured like they're out of perform. But here's an opportunity uh, to kind of connect to the group and, and get that human connection going that we used to have kind of spontaneously. Yeah. And this is, of course, also coming close to, to talking about mastering fear is a connection. People, we are people. You know, as people, we are definitely, we need this connection, correct, Ed? This link, this, this connection to the other, which yes. is now not there. Yes. And uh, personally, as I really miss my friends, I really miss my friend just talking about the easy stuff, the, the day by day. And yes, we call, but by being around sometimes a couple of hours, having a beer on a Friday evening or something, you it's much easier to get, you know, a better deep and better connection. And it's yeah. missing now. I, I, I really realize it's something I really need, so to say. Yes. And so if we talk about fear, what are the, the basic fears here that, that are really yeah, sort of popping up in this situation? The ones you, you would say uh, are, are critical for us human beings to, yeah, to sort of uh, um, overcome. Which are the ones you would say are, are critical, the, the fears to manage here in this situation now? 
Yeah, I think people do have several scares. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to list all of them. Things like uh, be, um, fears about losing their, 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 their job because we don't know how long this yeah. epidemic is yeah. going to go on and what it's going to do to our economies. So there's fears about losing the job um, and the kind of reassurance we would get from just having our boss smile when they saw us and make us realize that we were valued just isn't happening. Um, fears about asking for help. Um, because yeah, it's a lot yeah. easier if I'm not sure about something and I'm in a team, and, but you're, you're the one person that I feel comfortable with uh, to come by your office for just a minute and say, Martin, can I interrupt you for a second? I wasn't yeah. sure I understood what they said about this flow chart is a lot easier to do than it is in a meeting where there's eight other people. And um, not everybody is, is, has the technology savvy and sees computers and technology as their friend. So there are people that are kind of scared of all the demands that technology is making on them. Um, those are some of the common fears. <clears throat> and then of course, people's fears about their families and all, all, all those issues on top of it. So those are some of the <clears throat> common fears people have. One of the ways we've tried to ritualize and calm some of those fears is, as, as I mentioned in the last uh, question you asked, is in any group meeting or even any interaction like a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, to start with a ritual, um, and you could and you could vary it depending on the culture of the group. What's one yeah. of the high moments and low moments that you've had at work recently? Um, oh, yeah. What's uh, everybody goes around? What's one place you could use some help so that you're kind of um, making the culture one where people uh, are expected to ask for help? There was a very famous investment firm in um, New York, um, very very famous, very successful that had a policy that if you made any decision at all, that um, even though it was your authority, your responsibility, but if you made any important decision without running it by somebody, just to get their input, you don't have to agree with it, you don't have to take it, but you have to ask for it. If you didn't do that, you were, be, you were, you were fired. And the message to everybody is, we've hired a lot of smart people, including you, we expect you to take advantage of this resource. Yeah. And so we, we found this in successful companies. They, they made a very clear cultural statement that asking for help and giving help was essential. So now yeah, there is so a I, I, sorry, sorry. There is a caveat to that. There's a wonderful book by one of my favorite uh, business psychologists named Adam Grant. And he wrote a book called Give and Take. Um, and he asked a question in the first chapter and he also has a TED talk that's very good. He asked a question that I'll, I'll ask you, you out loud. Uh, and he says, do you think, he says there's two types of people in organizations. There's givers who are generous with their time and energy. They want to help other people. They see that as part of what their job is and what gives them satisfaction. And of course there's takers who are very competitive and will ask you for help, but have no interest in making your life any better. So in the first chapter of the book and in the beginning of his TED talk, he says, do you think givers are at the top or the bottom of their profession? And most people, uh, and people vary in terms of their answer, but what's counterintuitive, he says, givers are at the bottom and the top. The givers who uh, gave compulsively and gave to the point of not even getting their own jobs done because they, they felt like they had to respond anytime anybody wanted something, they were at the bottom. The givers who could set boundaries and only do it when they are met their own responsibilities. And when they recognize somebody as a taker, they cut them off. Those givers were at the top of every profession. So, yeah. um, so making a culture where people are expected to help one another is excellent, but it requires a whole culture that does that. And he said that um, if you have even one taker on a team, it, it lowers the productivity, creativity, and performance of everybody on the team. So uh, there's a caveat to this. Uh, I wrote Adam Grant, you say, yeah? yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and I was, I was thinking actually talking about this, this whole uh, sort of new way of working. Actually, we have to reinvent the way we communicate, yes. which is of course a huge opportunity to really find out what is important, how to do this and to really build the positive new steps in, uh, in how we uh, communicate and how we uh, find ways for 
Kaizen. Yes. I have to double check. Okay, okay, just I thought we just missed each other one second. Pause there for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. And one, uh, I also uh, I look at, at my um, my minutes uh, made, and um, I remember you also touched on the book uh, here, saying, okay, one of the fears is not being worthwhile. Yes. And the fear of losing control. Yeah, which is of course linked to okay, the leader, the manager. You know uh, the control. Where is everybody? How do I manage? <laughs> right. Where Which am I? Course. How am I doing? Yeah. Because you're not getting those measurements. You're not getting reassurance. Another yeah. way of doing that is uh, to ask people once a day to um, send out an email uh, to anybody in the organization, um, uh, thanking them for any any way they're contributing. So um, to to make it to, to ritualize some of these things. Um, yeah. And again, ideally, when we're in the physical space, these things are hopefully happening spontaneously and um, naturally, yeah. but we can't count on that, of course, anymore, um, yeah. at least for the foreseeable future. Correct. Yeah. Let's hope 21 will be better, but let's be realistic. It's not gone in a few months. That's yes. what it is. Yeah. Another thing organizations have done is they've actually asked people once once a week, um, we want you to contact anybody in the organization that you need help from or want to uh, share something with just to touch base with them um, and to ritualize that because I, I can take you through the research if you want, but any company that I know that's experimented before the pandemic, of course, was saying to p people, you can work from home, stop doing it because every, almost every study has found that the, some of these casual encounters with people you don't even see every day um, have led, led, led to so much creativity. My favorite example is when Steve Jobs designed the new building for Pixar, the movie studio, um, yeah. which is the most successful movie studio ever. Every movie they've made has been profitable. Nobody's ever yeah. come close to that. So he, when he bought Pixar and designed a new building for them, everybody in the building was furious because I believe it's like four or five stories tall. But if you wanted a cup of coffee, if you wanted to get food, if you wanted to get your mail, you had to go all the way down to the first floor and get it. And they thought, we're going to be wasting all this time. It's ridiculous. But Jobs knew the research and knew that uh, often those casual encounters while you're waiting for your cup of coffee um, those are the things that spark creativity. Google would slow down their cafeteria line, move their chairs too close together. So when you pulled your chairs back from the lunch thing, you'd bump into the person behind you. These things sound silly, but when they looked at breakthroughs in products, they found they were often somebody who bumped into somebody they barely knew. And through a conversation that uh, ideas came out that wouldn't otherwise come out. And we've lost that obviously with everything being virtual, but if there's a way we could start to ritualize some of it by having you bump into people virtually during the week. So you're not spending your whole day in front of a computer uh, writing software code or doing whatever, but you're having to bump into somebody at least once a week and say, how's it going for you? What's, what can I do to help? How, how can you help me? Um, it's because this can be a three minute conversation. Yeah, we have to organize ourselves and ritualize it. Right. It's yeah. a good kind of step. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about a new book, Bob. You have to, uh, you have to write <laughs> on this one. Just a, an easy one. <laughs> but it's also a good way to calm fear because you're yeah. connecting to somebody in the organization right. and remembering what it was like to, uh, to have pe people you trusted and could work with. Yeah. yeah. Good advices. Very practical, thanks for that. You're and very um, I shared with you one of the, yeah, it's, a, it's a famous book uh, called in English, True Persuasion. Huh? Yes. And I had, um, I had a great start already in, in the book uh, directly because she is uh, explaining about the basics yeah, around the brain. Huh? And um, then I thought, okay, it's nice to share with you um in relation to uh to our discussions who i have to do it i have to <laughs> uh, because uh pascel uh from uh Rutem, 
Yeah, the uh, English version when I said uh, true persuasion, the logic of charisma. Uh, she explains a lot about uh, what in the Dutch is called uh, selling ice cream to Eskimos. Yeah? Yes. She's talking about persuasion and then she said, okay, let me explain the, the hippocampus, uh, how it stimulates the cortex. So the positive area is talking about the hippocampus, the negative area is amygdala. We discussed a lot. And she says that when we are relaxed, um, we're easy to convince one of the basics. We need to stay relaxed because else there we talk. And then also that our thinking goes quicker when we're relaxed. Um, my question is, okay, what's your relaxion, rela uh, reaction to that in relation to leading continuous improvement? Huh? For example, could it be advice to make some jokes at the start of a daily operational uh, review to have people think quicker. What I mean is that people step in, they have all their basic stuff. And um, I can share with you, I already uh, uh, had this advice, I, I gave this advice to one of the teams I had once. And I said, start with a joke, because then people get really, you know, energized and uh -huh. relaxed. And actually, um, yeah, that, so that was at that time, it was positive. And I thought, okay, is there really also the basics behind are really true, that your brain is really uh, at least, uh, first of all, yeah, easy to convince, but also thinking quicker. Huh? Yes. So you can confirm that, so to say, I mean, from your uh, studies? Yes, and, you know, as, as we've talked about in, in the Kaizen book, the more afraid you are, because you're, uh, uh, the more pressure you're feeling, the more it turns on the amygdala, which shuts off the hippocampus and shuts down the cortex. Again, this ancient part of the brain thinks you're being chased by a lion. It doesn't want you thinking, it wants you just moving. And so if you can calm people's fear mechanism, then they can hear better. Uh, the hippocampus is where information is stored, uh, is able to do that better, and then re relay whatever it is that's relevant to the cortex. So absolutely, um, the, you know, the man who again has given so much credit for introducing small steps, both to the United States and Japan, Edward Deming, the sec second chapter of his textbook is called Getting Fear Out of, Getting Fear Out of the Workplace because there's just sure. no good place for it. Um, now, again, if you're trying to sell a, a fancy sports car or a, 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 it's a hot real estate market, uh, fear sometimes works because that's where the scarcity model comes in. If you're trying to scare me that if, unless I purchase this now, I won't have another chance. This is my last opportunity. So sometimes that works for one-time inter interactions with somebody that's, that wants a product that you have. But in terms of maximizing creativity, morale, health in an organization, fear just doesn't seem to be useful. It makes no. people competitive rather, rather than collaborative. It shuts down creativity. Um, but it, it has been historically a very common way to try to motivate people is by scaring them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, because what I, what I, uh, I shared with you, because uh, Pascal is saying, you know, the fear of scarcity is like this only this week, you know, the discount right. or this is the last ticket you can buy. And you think I have to. Buy. <laughs> yes. And I thought, how can we translate this into setting goals? You know, saying this is the last week to have 100%. Right. <laughs> and if it's a performer you want to see, that last ticket is going to be very important to you. But yeah. it doesn't apply too much in the workplace. <laughs> Not so much, is it? <laughs> No. Well, maybe we can say, you know, the last week you can really have some celebration or you can, can have a hundred euro uh, if you achieve this or that, you know, that could be an idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> but anyhow, so there was some, uh, some nice uh, uh, thoughts I had around the, because of this book. And uh, you shared with me uh, an, an article um, and then a nice article uh, around Kaizen. Huh? building, especially also related to quality building, quality culture, one small step at a time. There were examples about uh, uh, the things we, we shared. Um, also, uh, well, it was not only uh, the Toyota, the Seattle Children's uh, Hospital. But then I was triggered by one of the, the uh, studies uh, that were mentioned. And I thought maybe that's also a nice question to ask you because it was uh, mentioned around the Adelphi University. They did a study about the impact of uh, Kaizen with volunteers uh, talking about um, uh, yeah, improve their uh, their health huh? by their, their having their uh, 
uh, what was it, um, some exercise. Uh, could you uh, explain to us what was the main uh, learning actually from this, uh, from this study? Right. The Adelphi was the first of the studies. It's been repeated now a dozen times, looking at people who exercise uh, just a small amount, maybe three, four minutes a day, uh, versus those who exercise 10 to 15 minutes a day, versus those who are jogging five miles or more at a time and running marathons and those kinds of things. And what they found is that the people who exercised very moderately, three minutes to 15 minutes, got the same cardiac benefit as the people that were running marathons. And sometimes the people running marathons actually had less health because they were pushing their body beyond its, uh, more, its, yeah. its uh, way, way too hard. So again, the, the problem we run into is we've trained people to think of exercise as something they do in a special place called a health club or gymnasium. They have to be wearing special clothes, you know, jogging clothes and trainers. They, they have to be have, a, have all have to have home equipment where they're on a treadmill or something when in fact throughout most of history people weren't heavy because they were moving more um, they pushed a lawnmower they had to change they had to get up and change the channel on the television set people were just have historically been more physically active so the body doesn't need much to keep mobilized and so if you, can, if you can move more during the day, and again, as we talked about, even though you're home, can you stand and even move, move, um, stand in place and move your legs so that you're getting your heart rate up while you're in a meeting? Uh, you'll find you'll concentrate better. Um, and again, if you're the speaker and you see people getting up and down, <laughs> it may be a little distracting, but uh, you have to train your, audio, your speaker to realize that these are people who wanting to hear even you even better they're not people so bored they're trying to keep themselves away. <laughs> so there's a whole cultural piece to this. Well, so it is what you're saying. So the, the, the small intervention have, does lead to big improvement. So the, the big improvement, in other words, is yes. already in this small intervention. Not that we have to train ourselves half an hour or whatever. So it's also these all small steps. It's about yes. what you mentioned so much already to me, to us saying, you know, ask yourself, the same question every day. So if you want people to stay focused on some quality areas, just ask them every day, is it still correct? Did you fill in the controls? Or do you have an idea about a possible improvement? Or what did bother you yesterday? How could we help you, etc.? So it's the basic questions. And that's already having this huge effect in uh, having people and the culture really being focused on the continuous improvement, so to say. Exactly, yeah? yes. That's it. You're yeah. a good listener. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Thanks a lot. I mean, it's great <laughs> to uh, to hear your your answer again to some questions. I think it's it's enough for now. So we're going to close this session. Thanks a lot, uh, Bob. As always, and... it's a pleasure talking with you.